Okay, I'm recording. Yeah, that's so fine. That's however fine you want to start. I'm... Hi, guys. Andy N, Spoken Label, back in the house. On Zoom again tonight and on my phone here. We've had some technical issues tonight. Got a very special guest with me today as well. A gentleman called Jeffrey Bryan, who's had quite an interesting career. So, Jeff, do you want to introduce yourself to everybody? Tell them who you are <laughs> and tell us where, where all your creativity originally started from. And we'll take it from there. Okay. Um, I'm Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a musician in 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 uh, the United States. California is where I'm from. Um, you you uh, you want more <laughs> more detail? Uh, yeah, well, what we'll do is we'll go right back to the beginning for you, okay, Jeff? Because obviously, like I know you were born and raised in Los Angeles, yeah. weren't you? I'm. I'm. The um, thing is, I'm. I'm not used to um, introducing myself. I, I figured you had oh, some background yeah. on me. Oh. Um, right. Kind of, okay. I can, but I can that's do okay. That, but that's I, fine. Yeah, you, I, I, you can say whatever you want, but um, you know, I, I, I was uh, in the original Karate Kid. I'm the keyboard player for Survivor. Uh, we're going to talk about his career or whatever, you know, how he yeah, got yeah, from Karate fine. Kid to yeah. Survivor. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, obviously, like I said I know currently you're the key keyboard is a Survivor, and you've done plenty of other music as well. So I can see this reading up on you before. You've been a past, you've been a musical director and keyboardist for Clive Farrington oh, yeah. when in Rome. And you've played with the Keltel All Stars and well known percussionist CJ is it Ryer, is it? Right. Okay, now. Yeah, right. Right. Well, I'd say that's his point. CG Right. Yeah, he's a percussionist. Yeah. He's, he's a, he, you know, he's a kind of a well known percussionist. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard of him. I've heard of him. Now, okay, where did him, obviously, when you got the role originally for the Karate Kid? You were, I think you were 15 at the time, weren't you, on that territory? Well, you no, actually, um, I was uh, uh, kind of being sent out on acting roles when I was 15 and 16, uh, mostly because of singing and performing, which is what I was doing. I wasn't really an actor. That was not really my intention. Um, but back in those days, you know, acting and singing and performing they all kind of got lumped together and uh, I did the I did a show called uh, the Merv Griffin show which people would know who that was uh, it was sort of Johnny Par Johnny Carson's counterpart you know sort of uh, there was Johnny Carson there was yeah, yeah. Merv Griffin and I I was on that show I sang a song on that show and some people saw me and thought well you know we can make money on this kid he looks young and so they started sending me out on interviews and I was like whatever I wasn't really that interested, <laughs> but you know, I, I was kind of kind of pushed to do it because it was why not? What do you got to lose? Kind of thing. So um, I was going out on interviews for for movies, you, you name it. I was I was out for Breakfast Club and Red Dawn and uh, you know um, just so so John Hughes films, all kinds of movies I had auditioned for. I ended up landing a, a movie called Hot Moves, which um, I actually had a starring role in. And um, oh wow, it was just a small little budget, you know, kind of like a Porky's or a Fast Times at Ridgemont High kind of movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't a great movie, uh, but <laughs> that year I was continuing to go on interviews, and I I uh, I got the interview for some movie called Karate Kid, and um, that was 1983, and at that time. At that time, uh, you know, Ralph Macho had done The Outsiders. We didn't know who was in the movie at the time. It was just, you know, a Columbia Pictures movie. It had a decent budget. There were some cool people attached to it. But I was told it was just going to be a two-week deal for me. And um it turned out to be a six-month deal. <laughs> they, they they booked me for two weeks, and then and then they extended my contract indefinitely, which on the one hand was a good thing. Um, but on the other hand, it uh, it meant I did a lot of sitting around. The, there there were parts and there were lines and some dialogue and some other scenes that didn't make it to uh, shooting. They were cut even prior to uh, me getting on set. So there were uh, there, you know. So I, anyway, it was a it was a strange experience. It was the biggest movie I never acted in. <laughs> of my career <laughs> oh, I, a lot of ways say that <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah now obviously like I said that at the time obviously we were talking obviously before we started recording and like obviously the Survivor obviously were featured in the soundtrack to the film and all these years later you ended up actually joining the band didn't you 
And I was I was saying to you before, like you couldn't have ever envisaged you would end up actually joining the band at that time, could you? All those years no. later. Yeah, that's it was pretty remarkable. I mean, it it at the time, you know, Survivor. We knew that we knew Survivor from the Eye of the Tiger from Rocky Three, and yeah, of course. And it's not surprising that a lot of people that worked on the Rocky series were also working with the Karate Kid people because there were a lot of crossover. Uh, Jerry Weintraub, who produced Karate Kid, was involved with uh, John Avildsen, who, um, you know, got John Avildsen, who was the Rocky director, the original Rocky director, won an Oscar. And um, so they wanted a lot of the similar, th There, it's not, it's not really an accident that, there are a lot of correlations between Rocky and Karate Kid. They were trying to formula, formulate it the same way. And uh, musically, this, you know, Bill Conti, who wrote the score for Rocky, was the same guy that wrote the score for Karate Kid. And somebody's bright idea was, well, let's get, let's get Survivor, who did a, a Rocky song, because it's, it's big right now. It was 1982 when, when Rocky III came out. And so uh, there wasn't another Rocky yet. So the big song was Eye of the Tiger. So they wanted to, they, they asked Survivor to do the song. Um, I, you know, uh, it, it kind of went over my head. It wasn't something I was paying attention to until 30 years later, <laughs> you know, uh, wow. you know, cause uh, my career had, you know, I got back doing what I wanted to do after Karate Kid. I started getting, jumping more into music and doing the things that I had intended to be doing. Uh, and then 30 years later, I, I, I completely not connected to Karate Kid. It just so happened that I, uh, I was asked to be involved with Survivor. And it, I, I put the two together. I, I was doing my research with Survivor when I, was, when I first um, met them. And I forgot that the Moment of Truth, the song Moment of Truth, was the one of the theme songs for Karate Kid that was used in the trailer. And what's interesting about that is as I'm looking at their songs and doing some research, I notice I find the trailer, the actual movie trailer for uh, Karate Kid, and I'm in it. Hi. <laughs> so I'm, I'm by by virtue of being in the movie, I'm in the I'm in the video for the song Moment of Truth. And oh wow! And now now I'm playing <laughs> keyboards for that band. So it's it's like what, you know? Um, yeah, it's just it's incredible. Yeah, incredible I couldn't have planned like that. I I mean that it's just very 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 interesting. I mean if if we if we have time, you know, depending on the conversation goes, there's been a lot of little twists and turns that are not, uh, you know, they have no they defy logic in my career. Especially with regard to Survivor, we've had a lot of I've had a lot of near misses with them through the years that uh, didn't even oh, know. Have you really? Have you really? I didn't know that. All right. Wow. Yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I can tell you a brief one. Um, for example, yeah, many yeah, years, please. many years after the Karate Kid, about nineteen. Well, not many years. Only a couple years. At nineteen eighty six, nineteen eighty seven, I was recording with my band called The Reach at a recording studio called Rumbo Recorders in Canoga Park. And what's special about Rumbo's recorder, Rumbo, the recording studio, is that it was owned by Daryl Dragon, who is Captain Tennille. He's the he's the captain and Captain Tennille, and he was, uh, you know, a very very not only an amazing keyboard player, but he was well known for having this amazing recording studio that you know, Appetite for Destruction for Guns N' Roses was recorded there, and David Bowie recorded there, and you know, well, guess what? So did Survivor. And the year that I, uh, Daryl was a really sweetheart of a guy, and he, he let my band record our demos there for free. And uh, oh, when we were walking in, it's very possible we could have, it was around the same time they were recording Vital Signs for Survivor, their album. Uh, and it's very possible that I could have been walking in that studio while they were walking out the day earlier or a day later, uh, you know, because oh, it was oh, right oh. around the same time. And also Daryl Dragon is, you know, played on, on many of their songs. So there's, oh, there's, wow. there's these weird little connections that I've sort of had through my life. It's not by the time I actually met them and was hired by them. I didn't put all those pieces together until I sat back and looked at the history. And I was like, Oh my God, how did I not meet these people earlier? 
<laughs> I know it's yeah. You can, I mean, life goes that way sometimes, and yeah, you think sometimes it's like I've always been firm believer. I'm quite mystical and more in a few ways. Things come at the right time in your life, and when you're being creative, it perhaps wasn't meant to be at that time. Because like it was like yeah. if people obviously would research of you on this one, you can see Jeff how much stuff you've actually done really. Because I can see from reading up on you. Like you've you've composed music for dozens of cable TV shows, haven't yeah. you? Yeah, yeah. All kinds of shows. We don't know. I'm not going to go around naming them all because we're going to be copying. No, no. Do you don't want to do that? Uh, in fact, there's there's <laughs> a lot of shows that my music's probably in that I'm not even aware of because it's, <clears throat> you know, they're they're using them as with what they call in the industry needle drops, you know, background music and stuff. So I only find out after I see it on my ASCAP statements, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, it's the best way. I think it's the best way. It's a nice surprise sometimes, isn't it? Yeah. When you're looking at things, yeah. you're thinking, "Oh, it was on that? I don't know about that." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, re- recently I had you... a recently I had a piece of music that w- that's on the Rachel Ray show, and uh, oh wow, I, I I didn't know that, and then I I got a check for it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> oh, fantastic, fantastic. Um, was it uh, was it always keyboards for you then when you were when you first get into music, well, or were you no. always in, you into other instruments? No, well? I mean keyboards now. Yeah, I, I live and breathe keyboards now. But in those days, if you if you go back to my uh, you know kind of when I was just formulating who I was, I I really didn't play I played keyboards and I played guitar but those weren't instruments that I was pursuing as career models you know uh, oh, yeah. I was singing I was a singer songwriter guy that's what I wanted to do and the only reason why I picked up a guitar was because I was tired of singing other people's songs and explaining to them how the, how mine were supposed to go <laughs> very frustrating yeah, yeah. for a young singer at 16 you know uh, oh, yeah. so I was like I got a dad I need a guitar so I got a guitar and I started learning guitar and that was a lot of fun because uh, I was able to finally figure out chords and make my own songs. And uh, but I had been taking years of theory and and, you know, classical music training, even though it wasn't applied to an instrument. It was just learning how music works. So I, I could read and write music uh, and understand what I was looking at. But I didn't apply. I, I learned weird. Most people, they, they learn an instrument and they learn how to read music and stuff based on the instrument that they're trying to, um, you know, apply that knowledge to. And for me, there was no instrument. I was just learning music. You know, it was just yeah, something, yeah. something I was yeah. doing. And then by the time I was about 15, there was a piano in the house and uh, it was an old antique piano and nobody really played it. And I was looking at it and I it just, it just, it just, I don't know. There was something magical about a piano. And uh, when I sat down and started banging on it, I realized, wait a minute, wait a minute. Here are all the notes. This is all my, all my classic, uh, you know, classical harmony training was right there on the damn keyboard. How easy this is. So I taught myself <laughs> how to play piano because that was the instrument. And I, you know, I still play guitar, but I I basically uh, you know didn't continue as a guitarist although I do play uh, you know I play in the studio and I I still play with some other bands but primarily I'm a keyboard player and and it took me till I was about fifteen to realize that's the instrument I need to be working on. No, I can see that. Yeah, no, because like obviously like I've been looking at your website before, I can see what your live your live set your live rig and I don't know what date this was. Where how much how much material how much keyboards you've got, and um, I say it's an incredible amount of so there's that is keyboard. So do you find um obviously then for obviously looking at your live rig here is it I'm guessing as well from looking at this because there's no point I can name them all but it, things change all the time I know from technology. Yeah. Do you find that like your, your studio rig is probably about twice as big as your live rig is with various sorts of keyboards? Well, it dep- Well, no. I mean, maybe it depends on what the job is. Um, I, as a, as if you, you know, if my own preference, my personal preference is I like what they call electromechanical keyboards, real keyboards. You know, piano, Rhodes, Wurlitzer, Hammond, clavinet. I love those old instruments, and they're big and heavy, 
And I'm fortunate that uh, in my little collection, I, you know, I have a piano, but I also have uh, a 73 Rhodes and I have a Wurlitzer 200A. I've got a Hammond B3. Um, you know, and those those are my go-tos. You know, I just, if you just want to play and not have to think, and they, they're just beautiful instruments and they just do the job, you know. And there's a reason why those instruments are, are still, uh, you know, valuable today to, to musicians. On the other hand, um, many of the bands and even Survivor, you know, a lot of stuff is digital. And it has to be because, you know, you got it. It's easier to move. It's uh, you have more access to things. Um, but I have a you know, there's no there's no you know, there's no uh, it's there's no limit to what you know, whatever the job is, you know, I'll 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 make it work, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, I get you completely. I mean, I'm, with not, that one I'm not sure I answered your question, but <laughs> oh, it sounds good, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it sounded good to me. That was fine. So yeah, I got that straight away. So and obviously, that said, with the obviously the equipment you've got nowadays and your approach, obviously, to where you work is always constantly evolving and changing. Straight away with that. So now, have you actually obviously when you do live? Then obviously at the moment, live at the moment, obviously is on lockdown where we are. And I'm presuming it's where you are as well, then, really, isn't it? You're not able to gig very much at the moment, have you? Then, well, that is the 800 pound gorilla in the room. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's the, way, the so. unfortunate uh, that's what's going down right now. Uh, no, I'm not able to do what I'm supposed to be doing, it's pretty depressing. Yeah, it's the same for me because I guess I'm a writer, really, when I'm not in work. And it's like, it's been difficult because I, I gig all the time with a poet, really. And it's been really, really difficult. You can, like, all the venues are shut around here at the moment completely. Yeah. And it's like, we're just, I think a lot of it is we're just finding other things that other ways of being creative at the moment. Well, it's it's, like said, it's, it's really destroyed the, the music industry, at least from a performance perspective. There, it, it doesn't exist right now. Yeah, of course. No. I mean, you have well, to think, I mean, it's not just, you know, I know that there's there's Zoom shows and there's, you know, a few shows that you can you can tune into, but the you have to think about the industry too. I mean, there's there's the entire touring industry that is, you know, there are hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that are behind you know, not everything from catering to drivers to roadies sound engineers and they're not working yeah of course you know it's it's, no, a, yeah. it's a huge industry that's that's been affected not just the musicians it's it's everybody down the line and it's it's devastating this industry is just gutted it's just terrible right now at least yeah, it is in, i think it is around the world but certainly yeah. in the states yeah no it's pretty bad word over in manchester in england and there's absolute at the moment. There's absolute next to nothing open because our government at the moment are about to uh, just start announcing tears. It's going to get worse. Base, like, you know, yeah, it's going to get worse. That's what I heard, Definitely. right? England's getting a little yeah. worse. Yeah, we are in terms at the of the lockdowns. And yeah, it's, yeah. It's just I, mean, I think it's doing strange things to people at the moment, really, as well. So, well, a lot of it be is like I said, is just to hope we can pull out of it, really. So, yeah. What what we what I take it then, obviously, have you been finding up a project to keep yourself going and during lockdown? Have you really then? Have you well, just trying to do uh, little things? You know, yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm still doing the things I was doing before w when I wasn't playing, which is writing. I, I just released a couple songs. They're on Spotify, some new songs that I'm recording, my own. Um, I started to release some of my, not just songs, I mean, you know, my, my actual rock songs and stuff, but I'm also releasing... Uh, I just recently released a, a whole album's worth of some music I've written for TV and film. Oh, fantastic. So I'm, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just remastering and mixing and trying to stay busy. Yeah, I can get you played when I'm listening. You just have to hope, like, that. hope things improve, and that's all we can really do at the minute, definitely with that one. So, like, it's, um, I, I take it, obviously, like I said, it's, it's that be the case when Survivor, basically, when, when things obviously get back to normal, then you guys perhaps, perhaps start gigging again and really can't you? And doing who knows what, basically. And as things improve, yeah, it's very, very hard to judge at the moment, definitely. Um, growing up then, obviously, out of interest, was there any sort of favourite music you like listen to? Was it? What did you grow up listening to music-wise? Yeah. Well, you know, I'm I'm a little... 
I mean, I've listened to everything through the years, you know? I mean, I, I have my favorite artists and I have people that I that I do like. But, you know, it's hard for me to... I don't know if you... How do I explain this? But I don't know if you've heard this before, but as a musician, as somebody that's, you know, really immersed in music, um, sometimes listening to music is a different kind of an experience than it would be perhaps if I was doing something else and music was just purely for enjoyment. Because when I listen to music, I end up analyzing it too much, <laughs> you know? And so oh. uh, so I, I tend to, uh, I don't always listen to the things that I write anymore um, just because it's it, it, it allows me to, to kind of just be involved in the music and not and not uh, not analyze what I'm listening to. Certainly with pop songs, I'm always analyzing them. You know, I'm always listening to, well, there's the hook, oh, how long did it take to get there, and, you know, the formula. And, and sometimes I get bogged down in that. So the enjoyment of listening to some songs is kind of kind of difficult sometimes. Um, but with that said, uh, you know, I, I mean, I could name tons of artists that I, I, I love, you know, that, that I've listened to. Um. Is that what is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's fine. Yes, yeah, fine. Yeah. Oh, I was always just curious. Like, well, people I like mean, I can tell it. you, I can tell you who people that I've been influenced from through the years. I mean, we can start with the '80s. I mean, you know, Howard Jones and and uh, Thomas Dolby, uh, Brian Ferry, Peter Gabriel, Sting. These are all people that I've been, uh, you know, extremely influenced by. Um, yeah, yeah, of course. Cool. You know, and, and Annie Lennox, and you know, just I could go on and on. Oh yeah, completely. Uh, have you found and been a musician like yourself the years like yourself? And has there been any what you to miss famous people like you've met really apart from your work with a guy in Survivors? Um. Well, yeah, I, I've met with a. You mean in terms of not in a not working relationship? You mean not working relationship? Sorry, yes, I'm a bit vague today. <laughs> you can tell I'm getting tired. <laughs> well, um, uh, I remember I <laughs> there was I had an audition. There was, I was really young. I was probably twenty, maybe maybe younger. And um, I, I was I was still kind of still kind of acting stuff. You doing doing you know it was toward the end of it, and I got a call back in those days. Music videos were cast just like movies. Maybe they are still. I don't know, but but they they were always cast like movies back then. So the 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 labels would go to casting agents as if they were movie productions, and so it wouldn't be unusual to get a call to go on a music video. And uh, I get this call, and uh, I go on the, I don't know who it is, and I get there, and I, they call my name, and I go in, and it's Dennis D. Young from Styx. And Whoa. he's there. And he was doing the video for his, I think, Desert Rose, his solo album, right? You know, um, and which didn't do that good in the States, as it turned out. But, um, and that was a big thrill for me because I, I didn't want the job at all. I didn't care. I just wanted to talk to him about his keyboard rig. <laughs> <laughs> I think he got pissed. It was weird, too, because uh, I had to hug him in the audition. It was, you know, it was like a dad and a son kind of thing. And I, I, it just felt awkward to me. I was like, I, I just wanted to talk to him about, about songwriting and singing and music. And I think I totally fanboyed all over and I, I don't think I don't think I, I made a good impression and I knew I wasn't going to get the gig and I didn't care, <laughs> you know, but that was, interesting, you know, touring with Survivor, I've, uh, you know, we've come off the stage and we've we've and hi, him and his band have, you know, Dennis DeYoung's sticks um, were performing. So, you know, I've kind of bumped into them, you know, years later. Oh wow, yeah. Um, with you obviously perform with Survivor, then do you feel like your music out the way you do some of your songs and stuff has, has changed over time a bit? But I'm always a believer in anybody you work with in any projects, you get something out of it and your outlook changes and everything you do, a musician, writing, anything really. So you're saying you're asking me if, if Survivors change my outlook on music? Change change where you do your songs and like where no. you you I would say Thanks. no. Uh, well, the reason being is that remember, Survivor's got a forty-year history, and yeah. their their songs are considered to be you know hallowed ground. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, high on you and can't hold back. Um, yeah, of course. You know the search is over. These are these are beautiful. You know, well-known songs. You know, legendary songs. So I kind of see myself. The job itself is 
not just really keyboard player, but it's a steward of history. And so, yeah, yeah, no. so you know, it, it wouldn't. I wouldn't be doing my job. I wouldn't be doing the right thing if I was, you know, recreating them. I, or in in my own, you know, in my own way. The, I'm. I'm. My my whole point is that when people come to see a Survivor show, y you want to remind them of what it was like when they were 18 sitting in the audience. So you don't want to distract them with any new kind of. You know, it's a different kind of. I, I'll be honest. It's it's a very different kind of discipline when you're playing in a in a legendary band. You know, there's there's a certain responsibility I feel I have to the audience and to the material. So it doesn't lend too much to creativity in that in that way that you were asking. Yeah, yeah, of course. I should have thought that before. Yeah, and of course that does make sense. Indeed. Yeah, we be doing songs that are so established like that as well. So yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, because of course I'm look, I was looking at the lineup in Survivor before as well. And obviously, like I said, is the lineup obviously has changed over the years. Oh, like quite said, a now. bit. Yeah, quite, quite, yeah. quite a bit. They've had a lot of different members through the years, mostly keyboard players and bass players. Um, the band, you know, the band's kind of a strange band. They're kind of schizophrenic. They've had two lead singers that were both very famous, you know, for what they did. <laughs> Oh you know. yeah, and you had them. Um, there's not obviously it's not my story to tell, but yeah, I can certainly see like it. Yeah, yeah. So Falling the two, two yeah. quite major singers, and yeah, a few Dave, other people as well. Well, Dave Bickler, the first singer, he he's known for the Eye of the Tiger. He he sang the first three albums, and when he left the band for um, he had he had vocal issues apparently. Uh, you know, most bands don't survive that. No pun intended. Yeah. No pun intended there. Um, you know. And they brought in another singer, and they went on to huge, bigger success than they had. You know, uh, Jimmy Jameson came in on Vital Signs, huh? Saw that. Completely, it's incredible. Yeah, I mean, like I've... you, you get a lot of fans that are in one camp or the other. You know, you get guys that are, you get people that are interested in. You know, they they're, they they like the band when Dave Bickler was in, and other people are like, no, Jimmy's the guy. So there's there's a lot of that, you know. Um, their their catalog is uh, pretty daunting for any singer, and I think Cameron Barton, who is the singer now, he's about 26. He's phenomenal. He's he's able to cover both, you know, both. Uh, yeah, you know. yeah, I noticed that. So, yeah, yeah. Back to him, like I said, like yeah. just to take all that on, like it would probably leave more, certainly more older singers. In some cases, really nervous about it. Definitely so. Yeah, well, that yeah, that's the thing. This guy, this kid, basically has no preconceived. He, he's not. He's not nervous because <laughs> he's. He doesn't realize just how what what a what an you know. I'm sure he knows that it's it's a pretty cool legendary situation, but he doesn't have. He didn't. You know, let's face it. He was. He was born when the band had broken up by then. Yeah, of course it would be. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's them. not like me, yeah. you know, that would, you know, Jimmy Jameson. Oh my God, you know, for him, it's like, oh yeah, I heard of him, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, it would be like I said. Yeah. Oh so, God, yeah. so maybe there's some, you know, uh, uh, a method to their madness when you know, getting a younger guy, it's probably pretty helpful, you know, in that sense. Yeah. There's no preconceived, I mean, uh, you know, predetermined kind of kind of stigma that they have to live up to yeah they say something to youth as well don't you can be like do things fearlessly can't they yeah and when you get older what do, they, our say, age, what do they say uh, think, uh, bliss is ignorant or ignorance this is bliss or something you know? bliss. Yeah. Bliss, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah of course completely like, yeah you do it's like i certainly like it, it makes me smile like you're thinking yeah, yeah. like it's I've had but, the age I am now. Like I, got, but, I couldn't have gone and done it straight off the cuff. Like give him respect to him. <laughs> well, you know Frank Sullivan, Frankie Sullivan, the guitar player. He's still in the band, and he, you know, he's credited with writing all their songs with Jim Peterick. He's the original guy. He started the band, and uh, and you have uh, Billy Ozello, who's the bass player, who's been in the band since '95. So I, he's kind of like, pretty much, you know almost a lifer, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, you know, unfortunately the, the drummer, the original drummer, Mark Drew Bay, uh, has some health issues at this time in his life. So he's not touring with them anymore. So the band's, you know, pretty much down to Frankie. That's, that's really it. You know, it would be one that, yeah, of course, 
Yeah, I was reading Matt Frankie's profile before, yeah. And it's like, you get, like I said, it was like some bands like that, aren't they? Like ACDC and stuff like that. Everyone always thinks, of, like I said, of the, the guitar is Angus Young nowadays. And like, and it's just, you get a stage like, it's, in your case, it's a pleasure for you to keep playing with a band like this. And I can well imagine it. Yeah. We definitely were that one. Well, it's a thrill. Even, that's for sure. It's it's pretty interesting. I mean, I'm in other bands and um, they're, they're a bit more, you know, I have a little bit more creative room to to be myself because they're they're you know we're not we're not uh a 40 year old legendary you know thing but um but there's something to be said about you know with respect to survivor it's a very um it's a very exhilarating thing to have fans just love the songs you know and just know every word and know everything you know that and oh, that, yeah. that's a real exciting thing for a musician Oh, God, I've got to ask you, an obviously, the musician that you are, then. And I, when I ever speak to musicians, I like to know about funny stories they've got they've encountered over the years. Not ones that we can obviously we get us thrown off the air and stuff. Is, it, are you, is there any always stories that stick in your head as a musician, like funny things that happened every now and then, or gigs that were always a bit unusual for you? You know, I, I have to. Div I have to. Uh, if if I had a story, I think I I I'd stick I'd stick with Survivor uh, because you know. Like I said, they're they're a legendary band, and they have, you know, their fans have been around for as long as we've been around, you know, and um, yeah. and so uh, when I, I I'll tell you this one story, I think it's pretty pretty cool. It, it, it was my first gig with them, and we had uh, we've been rehearsing in Chicago, and then I think we had a gig in Indiana or something. I can't remember where it was, and so during sound check. And I had not played with them yet, other than a few rehearsals. And, uh, you know, the songs, the, the search is over. Uh, it's a ballad. And it's a piano ballad. And uh, before the song starts, Frankie says, hey, just play a little, you know, something to, to introduce the song. And so I, I said, oh, you mean something like this? And I played something. He goes, yeah, that's good. He said, but no, longer. I'm like, okay, like this. He goes, no, you know what? Just, you'll figure it out. I'm like, oh, okay, I, I guess I'll figure it out. So we get to that part. The show's going. Everything's, you know, first time I'm playing with them, so it's there's a lot on the line for me and, and, and for them too, you know. And uh, we get to that portion of the show where, where we're going to do the search is over. All the lights come down, one spotlight on me, and everybody got off stage. And I'm, <laughs> and I'm sitting there with the piano. And the you know and three thousand Survivor fans staring at me, and I'm like, holy shit! I didn't expect that. You could have told me. Um, so I I did what any uh, you know any, I think what what any uh, um, you know uh, attention loving musician would do. I just went into this huge piano solo, and I got the crowd going. Oh. And then uh, that went on for about a good 10 minutes. Really, really cool piano solo I did on my own. I just made it up on the spot. Um, oh, they kept it in the show ever since. <laughs> oh, I like it. Yeah. I like it. You, like you talk like about nerve-wracking, you know? Good grief, yeah. That would have absolutely destroyed me. <laughs> well, you know, my, my had two thoughts. I said, well, uh, they left the stage. So I guess it's my show now. You know, what am I going to do? Nothing. So I just dove right in. I just started playing really, you know, some blues and some cool stuff and had a good time. And I got the crowd going and it just worked great. And then we've kept it in the show ever since. So I must, I must have done something they liked. They took a chance. Yeah. You know, I got to give, I got to give, I got to give Frankie credit. He's got some balls, man. You know, he didn't know me. Didn't know if I was going to yeah, yeah. choke, you know. <laughs> really, really that one. Of course, I wouldn't, uh, but that's not the point. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Right, we're, start, we're starting to run out of time now, unfortunately, to be honest with you now, Jeff. So, obviously, um, I always like to ask people to conclude if people want to find out more about you, where are the best going? The best place to find me is on my website, it's got all my social media links and Facebook and YouTube. <clears throat> so my website is uh, www.jeffreybryanmusic.com, spelled 
J E F F R E Y B R Y A N Music M U I M U S I C dot com. JeffreyBryanMusic.com. That's the best way. Perfect. I'll make sure I'll make sure we get we we'll get you put down for that straight away. So that sounds perfect, mate. So thank well, you. That's Andy. all my questions. Yeah. And it's been a pleasure. I've really enjoyed it. So as I always say, hang around because obviously when we stop recording in a minute, I need a quick word of you anyway off mic. So Yeah, but that's fine. I, okay, thank you again. If you can, if you can stop you the recording for me now. <laughs>